morning everybody it's a sunday morning here in the american upper midwest beautiful day outside i think we're going to be jumping near 71 72 which is a pretty pleasant day if i remember that's about 18 degrees celsius or something like it's a really nice day uh humidity is next to none right now so the air feels cool and clean today i want to talk to you about another legacy record by a favorite blue art blue note artist of mine I think he's underappreciated by today's culture, but he's a fantastic player. He was one of the most of the Blue Note kids who were his contemporaries, but he certainly uh, was never outplayed by any of them. Uh, first, I want to talk about this fun record here, the Brothers Sandoli. Kind of legends of the Philadelphia scene. And it's a record you kind of read about here and there. And you once in a while will come across the references, especially to uh, the fact that um, there's two brothers, Adolf, and then the other one's name is Dennis. And Dennis was a guitar player with an inventive ideas. But it wasn't just his ideas as a guitar player. They were both kind of advanced harmonically and compositionally. And one of the things they really brought to the music was some of the scales and ideas of chords and harmonics that come from other cultures around the world and are normal to other sets of ears. Uh, Dave Brubeck, Blue Rondo, all the Turks, great example of them taking something that's kind of foreign to us rhythmically and pulse wise and, and melodically, but they delivered it in such a great way that that Turkish vibe of that just is great. Brubeck kills that. Uh, Brubeck's a, a brilliant mind. He connects with his audience as good as anybody. Uh, but Dennis Sandoli and Adolf Sandoli from Philadelphia and where you kind of come across their names is they were both, and I think especially Dennis in particular, were great teachers of the jazz tradition and adapting and grafting some worldly modern harmonics. And for you who aren't real music theorists, melody is the forward movement of notes that you hum along to. La di da di da di da di da di da. Harmony would be notes you stack on top to create chords. And sometimes when you create chords, you can create different tonalities in that single note would a trumpet can give you a melody. It can only give you a harmony with a series of other tr instruments or trumpets. You know what I mean? Because the melody is going to be what's established initially off the chords and the root of the song. But uh, so they were saying instead of just stacking your normal 135, 1357, you know, why don't we go 129? Or I'm just throwing numbers out there. You know, just abstract things maybe to us in the West, but commonplace in other places. And so they were introducing a lot of that type of harmonic idea ideas to guys like John Coltrane. And so he taught, Dennis taught Coltrane, I think almost a year and a half. And the, the, the list of names that they teach, like you listen to this here, uh, there's some real strains of Mingus, of some edgy Ellington, uh, guy like Jimmy Joffrey or Jerry Mulligan those kind of West Coast white arrangers that were doing the edges of the avant-garde really before anybody else in a lot of ways. This record's right there in step with that. Happening in Philadelphia, and this is from 56, on the fantasy label out on the West Coast, which seems kind of counterintuitive. Why would this end up in San Francisco on the fantasy label when there are two Philadelphia brothers playing with mostly uh, East Coast guys? But it's the nature of the record business, you know. It doesn't always make sense, per se. Great album cover. I don't know who did the album cover, but it's fantastic with kind of hints of noir, spy, crime, uh, mischief happening. It feels like it could be Otto Preminger brings you the murder of a jazz guitar. You know what I mean? It's, it's just got that kind of Henry Mancini, the black cat of... Montague kind of thing. So I, I really enjoy the artwork as well. But the music's really modern. For 56, it's right there in step 
with the edgiest things by Joffrey, by Mingus, by, <clears throat> like I said, Jerry Mulligan, where his arrangements were at that time. And Mulligan's really one of the most underappreciated guys in that scene. You can even put Gil Evans in that mix and uh, go back to The Birth of the Cool. This has some of that in it, although it's a little bit more dissonant than The Birth of the Cool. And there's a couple of notable players here, like George Barrow on the tenor, on the baritone, and I think uh, Sonny Roos is on the trombone, both Philadelphia guys as far as I know. I think Taylor Macero is on the tenor. I'm not even sure if I'm saying Taylor Macero correctly. And then Art Farmer plays trumpet on a lot of this. <clears throat> and so that's just some really great jazz players in an early moment in their career. Farmer's kind of semi-established, but he's not a big name by any means. And uh, Farmer, of course, is an Iowa native who really grows, grows up in Los Angeles and cuts his teeth out of the West. But it's a really interesting record. I got. I was just going to say, I was really impressed by it. It's got so many things that Pithecanthropus erectus, uh, Monk, Brilliant Corners, just edges, yellows and bright greens and chartreuse and just flashes of colors and shapes and sounds that is really 10 years ahead of its time. Uh, the soloists are all hinting <clears throat> at dissonance at times and, and breaking slightly sour at times, but it feels very much or orchestrated, very much uh, part of what they were trying to do. So the Sam Dolly Brothers is a really cool record. <clears throat> I don't know if this is available right now in a modern print. Probably isn't. I'm sure it is probably in Japan, although I'm not sure that said I've seen a lot of fantasy records in Japan, to be honest. Uh, I suppose you do see some of them. But, uh, so there's a, there's a list of a few guys. These guys, uh, Dennis Sandol taught. I don't know if it's Sandol or Sandoli. Not sure. Uh, John Coltrane. That's the biggest name, of course, that everyone's going to have an instant rela relationship with. The great Jim Hall on the guitar. The great, the great Pat Martino on the guitar. Uh, Michael Brecker, who I don't talk about very much. That's probably the first time I've ever mentioned his name on this channel. Rufus Harley, the bagpipe player. Learned from the Sandolis. Uh, you got guys like James Moody, the great rhythm and blues, uh, jazz kind of uh, duelist. He's a wonderful player who skirts those lines really well, has some R&B hits, but he's also very firmly established in, in the jazz uh, canon and lexicon. Uh, guys like Art Farmer, like I just mentioned, and Benny Golson, another Philadelphia native. A lot of these guys have Philadelphia roots to them. So the Sam Dolly Brothers record is a cool record and cool cover with modern sounds. And the, and the record's called Modern Music from Philadelphia. So it's definitely recognizing that uh, everything that's happening right now on the edges of jazz, we're kind of a part of that. We're not following or biting it. We're part, partly innovating that, along with the Mulligans and the Joffreys and the Minguses. This is a record that really has more edges than I anticipated. I expected it to be a little bit more Latin-inflected guitar jazz or something, and it's certainly not that. It's very much uh, group ensemble pieces uh, with, you get elements of Mancini even at times. Fun, fun jumpy, bright colors, uh, mysterious alleyways. Like you're creating, again, soundscapes for, that are soundtracks almost. And I've said that before about a lot of compositional music. It becomes more about setting a mood in a scene and becomes pi pictures by sound versus the blues, which is much more expressing just what my heart and soul feels. They're, they're, they're sourced differently and feel and sound differently. Music that's meant to make me feel a certain atmosphere is focusing my feelings and drawing attention to my composition is going to make you feel this versus the blues that's just expressing my sorrow helping me to find joy and kind of allowing the listener to interpret infinite ways almost and not trying to put you in a particular state of mind or thought process because it's mostly just a gut feel and if you ain't connecting with that gut feel your experience with it is going to be very different to begin with. So you have to be kind of cognizant of it. So again, the Zeta Sandoli record is a fun record uh, with his brother Adolf. 
who was a pianist, and it's a record worth searching for. And you won't find it easily, but it is out there to be had. And it's number 3-209 in the Fantasy LP sequence. And of course, there's a 10 inch sequence prior to that. But as far as the, the Fantasy LP sequence goes, which starts in 55, 3-209, they, they start at 3-200, which they eventually lose the dash. It just becomes 3200, 3219, 3273. I think the dash sticks around for 25, 30 titles or so, and it just becomes 3200. But that, that 209 means it's a pretty early record in the Fantasy Record discography catalog. And, uh, it's really an outstanding record, along with that John LaPorta record on uh, fantasy that me and Scott Ball would have talked about numerous times. These are some really modern records that you don't really think of when you think of a fantasy. You know, you think of fantasy more as kind of, uh, obviously, Cal Jader with that Latin inflection and Brubeck with his deft touch and uh, propulsive, percussive, but magnetic playing that really drew people and sold well. Those are kind of the two standards of what fantasy is about. You have guitar players like Robert Duran who's playing kind of, you know, West Coast chill guitar stuff. And so these kind of modern pieces, uh, the Gus Mancuso records have some of that modernity in them. But especially the John Laporta and the Sandoli, it's a rare showcase for fantasy to show you how open they were to interesting stuff that was beyond the realm of the normal. So as, as for today's legacy artist, we're going to talk about Lou Donaldson. And I'm a big Lou Donaldson fan. I've seen the guy live probably 2003 or four. He was in his 80s then, I believe, uh, maybe late 70s. But he was an old guy already. But he could still do the chop. You know I mean? He still th flew through the changes of the Cherokee like it was nothing. And he had this uh, Japanese gal. I think she was on the organ, if I remember I'm pretty sure she was. She might have played piano some too as well, if I think about it. She should probably play piano and organ. And uh, it was a drummer and a bass player. And I don't really know who any of them were. Uh, but they were fantastic. And Lou was just killing it. And you could tell these young kids were pretty thrilled to be on the road with Uncle Lou. You know, and Lou's a legend. He's just such an icon that today's collector has had diminished for them some by the collecting YouTube industry. And part of the issue, Sandoli's, Ellington, Mingus, like it's beautiful dissonance there. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a yellow mustard room that you're in. Like you're, there's some ah, in that room. You know, I mean, a little bit of eh, yeah, what's going to happen? Like that tension's there, uh, but re tension needs resolve, and that's what makes great music of that nature. So Lou is like a real underappreciated guy because his records sold pretty well for Blue Note. They mostly have stayed available in print, so you can find them for a good price. And so he suffers from the Jimmy Smith Three Sounds illness of I can find those records for under 50 bucks, they can't be any good. Which is the stupidest, most asinine aspect of the modern collector. That's an indicator those records sold well. Three Sounds records are always awesome. They're fun to listen to. Jimmy Smith records ain't, he's the greatest virtuoso. I mean, he's everything a guy like John Coltrane is. He's an incredible player. Jimmy Smith rips those instruments apart. And then the instrument gets up and thanks him. Jimmy Smith is a bad man. But so many cats are like, oh, Jimmy Smith, you can get those records easy. I don't really collect organ jazz. It's like, if you can't feel the blues and, and the virtuosity of Jimmy Smith when he's when he's shredding, he's on par with anybody in the industry. He was a bad man and had everyone's respect. And his record sold well. Uncle Lou had that same disease. He was moderately successful and his records sold well. They were accessible. And because they've been available in print and there's lots of different pressings of them out there. Japanese always have Lou Donaldson, right? They love Lou Donaldson over there. Uh, his records have never really fetched the same value as some of the hard boppers. And Lou's career is goes back to the bebop era. Like he's very linked with that early lineage. 
And if you want to hear Lou Shred play the uh, album he does with Clifford Brown on the Jazz Messengers, uh, is that Cafe Bohemia? Or is that Birdland? I got to check it, which one of this. We should all get it wrong. It's a night at Birdland. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the little order at the beginning of the, of the album. Clifford Brown, Curly Russell's on the bass, Art Blakey's just thrashing, Lou Donaldson's on the drums, uh, Curly Russell, who's on the piano? Is it Horace Silver on the piano? It might be Horace Silver. I gotta double check that now too. My old age isn't trusting myself anymore. Of course it was Horace Silver, an early rendition of the Jazz Messengers, Blakey and Silver. And of course I'm speaking about these Night at Birdland. These are the original 12 inch versions. They come as three 10 inches prior to this. Uh, this one has a note in it saying Best Witches and Happy Holidays. Because I bought this off of Discogs and the seller recognized me from my name and the channel. So it gave me a nice price on it as well. And uh, this is the original covers for these on Blue Note. Again, they did. They came as three 10 inches prior to this. And they got a second cover, which is Reed Miles and more iconic in a way. But these these old ones are fun to look at for sure. And again, it is Curly Russell, Horace Silver, Lou Donaldson, <clears throat> Clifford Brown, and Art Blakey. And if you want to hear what a guy like Lou Donaldson can do, when you're playing with Clifford Brown and Art Blakey, you, you don't really got a lot of choice to sit back and say, you know, I'm going to take the day off and sit out. You got to throw down. And Lou can throw down. And on his own, he's doing a lot of stuff for Blue Note. Quite some just real dissonance on that. Uh, Lou's doing a lot of work for Blue Note in the 1500 series. Some of it actually comes from the 10 inch series again there as well. So 53, 54, 55, 56. He's firmly entrenched in the transition to bebop in a hard bop. And he kind of reaches that pinnacle of his hard bop playing here on All Lou Donaldson Takes Off, which to me is my first candidate for Lou Donaldson Legacy. It's not going to be the ultimate winner here, but it's going to be a candidate. With the great Donald Byrd, the great Curtis Fuller, the great Sonny Clark, George Joyner and Art Taylor on bass and drums. It's a hard, driving, uh, hard bop masterpiece. It's really a five-star hard bop record played by some of the greats. Uh, and Lou was just in step with these kids. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a bit older than them, but uh, Lou is like just fire. And he can play with lava coming out of that alto when he wants to. But again, it's he's also aware that jazz has seasons. It changes and it moves. And he's already seen jazz change several times in his lifetime. So he's not going to get too entrenched in anything. And that's 1591. And a short two records later, 1593, is Blues Walk. And for me, this is probably his legacy record. It's the cover you're going to see first by him. It's the record that probably is going to get in the most playlists. And uh, you put on a, some kind of Blue Note streaming songs, and this will definitely show up. It's a great record with a great cover. Uh, of course, that's his signature up at the top there, and uh, that was pretty cool. That's from when I saw him. I brought some of his vinyl down, and I brought them to have him sign a couple, and he ended up looking at them nostalgically, saying he hadn't seen his own records in 50 years, he told me, which I thought was pretty cool to be able to sit there with Lou Donaldson backstage and show him some of my vinyl. And, of course, this is back in 2002, 2003, in there somewhere, before vinyl is really kind of commonplace again, it was still like I was one of the weirdos doing it, you know. And uh, Lou was just a character, just a sweet guy to talk with. And he's still alive. We still love Lou Donaldson. You know, I mean, all praise the, the mighty Lou Donaldson, Uncle Lou. Uh, so, again, Blues Walk is actually a, a bit of a departure from Takes Off. And it's a mere two titles later. But it shows you sometimes how even your sidemen can dramatically impact the sound of your sessions. And this has got the great Herman Foster, who's a blind piano player, 
has some great records on uh, Argo and Epic, I think it is, Epic. Yeah, uh, just a great player, rhythm and blues, solid stride, grooving. Uh, then you have Peck Morris on the bass with Dave Bailey on the drums, and they had Ray Barretta on the conga. And the, so what this does, instead of having a hard driving blue note, hard bop, uh, thumbprint session, you know what I mean? That's almost cliche hard bop in a way. It's so aggressive and intense. This is much more laid back and cool. But West Coast was cool, so they didn't call it cool. But this is Lou Donaldson cool. And it's a precursor even to the soul jazz that's going to start happening. Even the Boogaloo, which he becomes a pretty big proponent of. And again, the Boogaloo is kind of just an up-tempo rhythm and blues. It's crossover accessible. This is probably his legacy record. And not just because he signed this. He picked this one out of himself out of probably 10 that I showed him and signed it. Uh, but he was he was really enjoying looking through them and seeing them. And there was a corner shed of a, even a tear in his eye. Just the reflections of life, I'm sure. Seeing something from your own youth and having not seen it, it, it can make you a little emotional. And he got a little like misty, I swear to you. I chatted with him for 10 minutes. One of my finest jazz conversations. I've also had a great chat with Wynton Marsalis backstage at downtown Minneapolis after his show. And he was probably 10, 12 years past the, uh, the Ken Burns documentary. But I thought he's one of the greatest orators in that thing. He's just a great storyteller. He brings the stories to life. And when he's not sure you understand, he picks up that trumpet and illustrates it for you. Just, I, I could listen to Winton talk all day. Uh, I don't listen to his music very much, if I'm honest. I have a few of his albums on vinyl, but uh, him and his brother. But two of the modern legacy, con you know, contact connectors and just important parts of that uh, jazz canon. But he was a great talk, conversation nonetheless. So Lou, after Blues Walk, makes a series of Lou Cool. Lou's Cool records are some of my favorite records. They almost always have the Ray Barreto conga. I think there's another conga player who plays on a couple of them as well. Lou's name escapes me right now. But it's, you know the name when you look at it, you go, that's a Latin percussionist. But uh, those records are fun, uh, have cheeky covers, cheeky titles with kind of sexy, flirtatious vibes and names and uh, they're meant that's what they are they're they're fun get to know your records you know that that sold pretty well uh, this one's a bit of an interlude 4036 probably 59 and uh, this is with Horace Parland the great Bill Hardman who is one of those trumpet players who really gets kind of overlooked and forgotten he does play in the jazz messages in 58 along with Jackie McLean and Johnny Griffin He's a part of some great Jazz Messenger records in 57, 58. There's the slew of records made by the Jazz Messengers on labels, not Blue Note. And I've talked about that many times. There's Jubilee stuff, Pacific stuff, Bethlehem stuff, uh, Electra. It just goes on down. There's like six or seven different labels they put stuff out on in that, in that year and don't really find a permanent home. And they end up coming back to Blue Note and the lineup changes again. You know, Morgley and Mobin and Mor Mobin and Morgley, Mobley and Morgan, uh, Curtis Fuller. The band kind of moves on. Hardman kind of gets cast aside along with a lot of the other members of that band. Thank you to Brass. Kind of gets forgotten, you know. Uh, but Hardman gets a few side sessions at Blue Note with uh, guys like Lou Donaldson. I'm a big Bill Hardman fan. Uh, Layman Jackson's on the bass. <laughs> Al Harold's on the drums, uh, New York drummer. And then, of course, the great Horace Parlin, who I'm a big fan of, was the piano player. And uh, Parlin's kind of an underappreciated guy, if you ask me. But uh, I wouldn't say this is a legacy record, but it's a great, again, transition in 1959 60. You see moving towards the soul jazz. And this, to me, again, is probably not a legacy candidate, but it's fun. Light foot. And I think Herman Foster's on this one still. He is along with Ken, uh, Bray Barreto. Candido might be the other uh, one. Uh, Peck Morrison's on the bass, and Jimmy Warmworth is on the drums. Again, just a great cover. Lightfoot, Hogwaz, a track I play sometimes live at my gigs. It's just a fantastic player. 
who again these lighter tone records were where he was comfortable where he wanted to be starting with blues rock and i think the modern jazz collector doesn't always resonate with things that aren't difficult to listen to which again is a travesty in my mind but lou ends up leaving a blue note for argo and it's i think it's mostly cadet releases by then because of the lawsuit but when he's on cadet he makes six records there that are fine chicago blues uh proto boogaloo in a way and sidewander of course happens in uh 63 a blue note and it over in chicago at cadet Lou Donaldson seeing the changes happening in Blue Note and Prestige. And Argo's kind of always embraced the rhythm of blues being in Chicago. And so he ends up coming back to Blue Note. I think Lush Life was his first LP back. It's a great session. But Alligator Boogaloo, which is probably 65, 42, 63, maybe 66 even, it puts it pretty close to the sale, to Liberty, and uh, where Blue Note ceases to exist in the way it existed prior to the sale. And this is primetime Boogaloo. Uh, the title track, of course, was a pretty big hit, helping keep uh, Blue Note fluid. And also was probably part of what helped the sale happen was records like this still being successful. If they were all just clunkers that weren't selling, you had a harder time selling the label. Uh, you have Lou with a uh, Melvin Lasty on the cornet. A uh, Melvin Lasty Sr., huh? I never even noticed that name before, if I'm honest. I look, I'll play this record a dozen times easily. George Benson, a very young George Benson, who we talked about recently, is on the guitar along with Lonnie Smith on the organ, who gets records as a leader coming up shortly. And the drums have a guy by the name of Leo Morris. A fun record, and it, it does encapsulate some of his legacy because it was a really well-selling record. The, the single did really well. But you really got to say Blues Walk is the pinnacle for Lou. So Brother Sandoli. Check that stuff out. Lou Donaldson, a giant that deserves all kinds of credit. Blues Walk's a legacy record that every collection should have. And there's a few other records by him I think everybody should have. Uh, this is the last chance for you guys want to give me a little two, three minute video. Send it to my email. Uh, celebrating our 500th, 500th episode coming up next week. I'm going to do an episode where I have a mind. I've already had about 12 videos. So I'm going to throw them and piece them together. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do it yet. But uh, last chance to get a couple more in the end of the mix. Uh, if you just want to say why you love jazz, why you appreciate the channel, and uh, introduce yourself. It helps us also in the comments to kind of get to know each other a little bit. So appreciate you all. If you want to subscribe to the channel, hit that like button. That's always appreciated. If you want to support the channel, there's a Patreon link in the description below where you can pledge a few dollars a month. It all helps out if you appreciate the content. There's a merchandise store below with Jazz Shepherd merchandise in it as well. Uh, so appreciate you guys. Y'all stay safe. We'll talk to y'all soon. Peace.